each episode of Floyd Street's Finest, a Louisville basketball podcast, part of the Field of 68 Media Network. I've got a great guest for you guys this week. It's been a star-studded cast of characters who have come on here, and I've also had Mike Rutherford on uh, in addition to all those other great names. But uh, Larry O'Bannon is joining me today, member of the 2005, or 2005 excuse me, Final Four team for Louisville, who has gotten into coaching after a long and, and successful playing uh, a, a pro career overseas. And he's also the host of a podcast, The Player's Perspective Uncensored. You can follow it on Twitter at the PPU podcast. Uh, if you want to pay attention to those uh, episodes, and I'm sorry that there's a little bit of a distraction here. I've got uh, a little co-pilot here who's demanding pets uh, during this episode, so I apologize for that. Um, but nevertheless, uh, for people who are listening on the podcast, I swear to God, I'm, I'm showing a, a video of my dog and nothing else, so get your minds out of the gutters. Um, super happy with this episode. Uh, Larry has been helpful over the years from uh, talking to him about a, a variety of things of stories that I've worked on. Um, and, and of course, nobody knows Rick Pitino better and, and the Louisville years in the early stages. And there's even a great anecdote in there about Scotty Davenport, which will probably not surprise any of you um, to hear this, the, this little tidbit that Scotty Davenport contributed to Larry O'Bannon's long uh, career and just his life in general. Uh, we talk about the Final Four run, what the experience was like. We talk about playing overseas. We talk about Rick Pitino, a uh, little bit into uh, the current Louisville squad, although with Larry coaching now, it's it's a little more difficult to be able to watch as many games as he would like, but uh, still has some good insight into them. And, and it's always interesting to hear what folks have to say. Now, as of this recording, Louisville's game against Syracuse has been postponed. Uh, I was hopeful that we would have more basketball to look forward to this week. I'm not entirely convinced uh, this may age, but uh, as of, again, as of this recording, I'm not entirely convinced that we'll get to see Louisville at Virginia on Saturday either. Uh, hopefully we do. Hopefully everyone's okay and this thing all turns out okay, but I guess we'll find out. Um, but we are coming off of, uh, if you're, in, in terms of podcasts, we're coming off of a Monday victory for Louisville over Georgia Tech, which if you have not already subscribed to the Floyd Street's Finest podcast, uh, you, would, uh, you would not have known that uh, we had a little post-game wrap talking with Rob Doster and Jeff Goodman. Before we get into the Larry O'Bannon uh, conversation, I have two things I got to say. One is make sure that you are subscribing to the YouTube channel for Field of 68. There's a lot of videos on there. We've got some fun projects we're working on. And every time that you guys subscribe to that or you leave a rating or review on the podcast, we have great podcasts across the college basketball spectrum in addition to this one, which I like to think is a, a decent podcast. It's not bad. It's a pretty good podcast like those billboards uh, around town say for, I think he's a real estate agent, but he's pretty good. He's a pretty good realtor, a pretty good podcast. Um, those ratings and reviews and subscriptions and all that stuff help us expand and help us do cool stuff. So if you like us doing cool stuff and you think we do cool stuff or think we have the potential to do cooler stuff than whatever we're doing now is, um, then go rate and review it. Go subscribe to the YouTube channel because that helps us develop the field of 68 network with a lot of really talented people uh, doing team specific podcasts as well as national podcasts. The other thing I'm just going to say is I've said a lot about the Georgia tech Louisville uh, game and what that potentially could mean for Louisville. I just want to add one other thing. And that is that Louisville has a chance here. I talked about this with Bob Valvano on his show. There are teams every year, every year, a lot of them, where you think the potential is, is significant and they never quite get there. And I think what we're seeing with Louisville right now, and I wrote about this in my newsletter, which, side note, do subscribe to my newsletter. Go to jeffgreer.substack.com. It's called the Floyd Street Tribune. Seven bucks a month is all I'm asking you for. It takes a lot of time to put that thing together every week. So I appreciate it. Like a, like a chef preparing a good meal, I appreciate your support um, for good quality product. But 
as I said in my newsletter, Louisville is a, they're not young, literally young because they're actually a bunch of sophomores and, and older, but they're an inexperienced team. The fourth most inexperienced power league team in college basketball behind only Auburn, Duke, and Kentucky. And you know how those seasons are going for those teams. So they're, you should expect them to be uneven. But I think the promising thing about the Georgia Tech performance is not necessarily just that David Johnson's shooting well, that Sam Williamson had a great game, that Gabe Wisnitzer uh, gets in there, but it's that Louisville's defensive energy and continuity uh, and effort continued through the Clemson game. They've now had three or four solid defensive efforts in a row. Three, I should say. Duke was a really good one, uh, in particular David Johnson, but he had help uh, in the second half on Matthew Hurt. They had lapses because, again, they're an, they're an inexperienced team. And honestly, Duke had, what, three good looks to tie the game. But the defensive energy between Duke, um, Clemson, even though they lost, they played great defense, and they kind of wasted a great defensive performance. And, uh, and then the Georgia Tech game, really promising if you're Louisville. So I think that's been something that was really frustrating earlier in the season was energy level and not just having it out of the gates, but sustaining it for long periods and avoiding the lulls. And I think Louisville has done a really good job the last couple of weeks, uh, last couple of games of really having good energy throughout. And um, especially against Georgia Tech, I mean, they just never let up. And that's a big part of, of winning games in the league. As we saw, Virginia Tech almost came back and won at Louisville after Louisville kind of took the foot off the gas pedal uh, emotionally and, and in terms of energy. Um, and Duke, Duke stuck around for a little while, but Louisville sustained energy and returned to it a little bit even more so in the second half, turning things up, really changed the, the complexion of that game and helped them win it in the end. So the defensive side of the ball is what I think is a really promising thing. Um, it's really good to see uh, Samuel Williamson getting involved as an out of area rebounder, be a physical guy under the basket. I think that will really help Louisville if he sustains it. Um, a lot of his rebounds were in traffic. He was pretty good about just collecting um, weak side rebounds off misses, but he also got into the fray a little bit on both ends of the floor. Uh, and that's something that Louisville needs a little bit more of. They need a little bit more of that toughness uh, from some of their guys to get in there and really mix it up. And he did that against Georgia Tech and has been doing that now for a couple of games. So really positive development. Anyway, uh, that's just some thoughts I have since we don't have any more basketball, presumably the rest of this week. Um, Louisville now 11 and four looking to me probably by their resume and, and nothing is in a vacuum, but right now probably an eight, nine uh, game candidate, maybe a seven, 10 game candidate. They need to get some big wins coming up the rest of the season. They do have a bunch of quadrant one games left. I think it's six. So there's an opportunity there to really bolster their resume or uh, to lose a bunch of games and fall out of NCAA tournament con uh, contention, which is exactly what you would expect out of a team in the seven to 10, eight to nine range um, in seating. That being said, Larry O'Bannon is my guest on this week's Floyd Street's Finest, and I am so excited uh, to have a great conversation with him. I hope you enjoy it. All right, we've got a very special guest today. It's Larry O'Bannon. Larry, what's going on, man? How are you? Man, nothing much, man. I appreciate you having me on the podcast. Pleasure Absolutely. I got to make sure I get the name of this podcast right. It's the, I know it as just PPU from Twitter, from seeing it on Twitter. It's the Player's Perspective Uncensored. Uh, this is the host of it, Larry O'Bannon, but of course, Louisville fans also know Larry from the 2005 uh, Final Four team and, and the years leading up to that. And I'm so excited to have you on, man. So tell me, what's life like as a podcast host? What, what have you learned about yourself doing it? Uh, man, it's interesting. The best part about it is being able to catch up with some of the people uh, that you might have played with or people that you may have always wanted to meet. Uh, I know for me, it was always cool. I never got a chance to meet Cornelius Holden in person. So I was able to link up with him and do a podcast with him. Um, I've been able to link up and connect with a few people. I haven't got a chance to interview them yet, but they're lined up. So like the old Bannon brothers and a few other people that, you know, I've, you know, admired from a distance, but I never got a chance to meet in person. So uh, Milt Wagner was another person I never oh, got a chance to good. meet in person. But having him on the podcast is a chance for me to interact and meet him, man. So it's been pretty cool in that aspect. 
Yeah, Milt's really cool. I like talking to him. Every time I hang up with him, I'm like, that guy has more cool, like in reserve of how cool he is right, than I right. could dream of. Like, he's just got so <laughs> many great stories. Um, but that's really cool. H- how is it different? Like, so you were probably so used to being interviewed over the years as a player, and now you're, you've been into coaching a little bit. I'm sure you've had some interviews through that, but it's different when you're the one trying to start the conversation, isn't it? Uh, it is. What? Well, it just takes more preparation because now I have to really do some research to, you know, ask legitimate questions. I have to think about what some people may want to know and, and keep it interesting and just kind of, you know, keep it authentic at the same time. But really preparation and doing your research and uh, try to dig up some things that people may not know to ask about. Those are the things that really change once you host the podcast or host an interview. Yeah, that's for sure. It's and and it is like it's conversation, you know, like the podcast is it, you can, on the radio, you can get away with just, it's just questions. But when you're doing a podcast, I feel like it needs to be a conversation for it to be right, good. Right. Um, so I got to ask you this. I, I've always been so interested in this story here and you, you'll have to tell me what you're allowed to talk about and what you're not allowed to talk about. I don't want to catch you off guard here, but the, <laughs> but right. the, the famous late night runs in Louisville, I know that that's like uh, there's some lore behind that uh, of, of you playing in those over the years, right? Uh, are you talking about me and BJ? I tell me what you're talking about. I need a little further detail. Yeah, like the night. like the guys who would play late at night, and and Louisville players would come would come play. I I assume you participated in those over the years. Oh, you talking about? Oh, I thought you were talking about like. Food, bro. You talk about basketball games. Basketball. Uh, no, no, no. Food we could uh, talk about uh, in a little uh, bit. We'll yeah, start with basketball. <laughs> uh, yeah, they were. They were before um what was it Cardinal Cardinal Hall? Uh, what was the old basketball gymnasium? Crawford, uh Crawford. Crawford Gym. Gym. Yeah, yeah, before Crawford Gym got tore down, man. It was some really good runs in the hot box. And so uh, they'd be in the morning, but a lot of times at night. Uh, guys would come in and play. Some of the pros would come in and play. And, and other pros that didn't go to Louisville would come in and play, man, just because the pickup ball was so good. And so, uh, yeah, had some really, really, really good runs. I, I caught a glimpse of it my freshman year. After that, they, you know, they shut it down. So, mm-hmm. Okay. So, but that, what a good learning experience. I feel like Louisville is a great city for that. Like, like you know, the Donovan Mitchells and, and Dang Adels of the world more recently getting a chance to play with guys who are just back home. That, that's a huge difference maker, I would think, for young guys and their confidence. It is, man. It's always cool to see the young guys come in. Uh, Terry Rozier, Donovan mm-hmm. Mitchell, Dang Adele. Uh, those good, you know, humble guys, man, to come in and just want to play. And, you know, as us being the OGs at the time, we, you know, we play and they get out there and play with us. And afterwards, they ask us a bunch of questions, just, just trying to pick our brain, trying to, you know, get better as players, man. They always had that hunger and that drive to want to, become better I always wanted to know when we were coming in the gym want to get in the gym what is some play and just get better so you knew they were bound to su- for success just for the mentality to drive that they had yeah definitely well so speaking of the 2005 final four run the squad that you were on had a bunch of guys who have who have had and and uh I mean now it's getting up to 16 years after that really long pro careers and not just NBA but all over the world um, what, what is your main takeaway knowing that, 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 that group that performed at such a high level, uh, back, you know, 15 years ago, 16 years ago, put together so many guys who, who went on to, to have long careers. They've been coaches. Um, it's just a whole group of different guys who have, who have been around the game for so long. What, I guess, did you take away from knowing that now after experiencing that final four with them back in the day? Uh, just for the simple fact of how well they knew the game. I think that's what made us so special. It wasn't that we were overly talented so much more than everybody else. I mean, we were talented, but, you know, you had other teams that were talented. Just take the the Washington Huskies team that we played, Brandon Roy, Nate Robinson, uh, Jamal Williams, uh, Will Conroy. I mean, team was loaded with talent. I mean, not that, you know, we weren't, but – 
I think from a standpoint of chemistry, I think that was the superior thing that we had and just knowing the game. I've been playing together for so long and just knowing how to play the game, I think that was a big advantage for us. And so it's no surprise to see those guys take the things that we learned and the knowledge of the game and just trying to pass it on into the coaching world and to the next generation. So, um, you know, just knowing how to play, you know, some of us were able to go and play for a living for a number of years and uh, we're able to have some success with that. And so, uh, you know, we just try to carry it forward to the next generation now with the uh, coaching aspect. Now, what was your – do you remember your first interaction with Patino? Uh, yeah, I do. <laughs> over, what was over, it? In, pers- in person or over the phone? I, uh, both. Let's hear – Let's hear because I assume he called you first. Yeah, he did. He called me, uh, told me it was Rick Patino. When I first heard – I was jumping up and down. It was crazy. <laughs> I, I, like, what the hell are you doing calling me? And so um, he called me, said he wanted to come watch me play. And so they had set up an open run at, Mel, at my old high school. And a bunch of the top uh, basketball players in the city, high school players in the city, got together to play uh, pickup. You know, cause we had a number of Division I athletes come out at the same time, a uh, high major uh, Division I athletes in high school in Louisville. And so we had got together, we played pickup, and honestly, I didn't even play good. I didn't even, I, I didn't play well at all. But he had already <laughs> had his mindset that he was going to offer me a scholarship anyway. And so um, first time I got to interact with him, he came in with his long uh, trench coat on. And, you know, so he's <laughs> moving, cachet, walking in, and, you know, shook my hand, talked to me, and, uh, you know, said, I'm offering you a scholarship, this and that. And that was it. That's where I knew I was going. Were you – was it – was it more – I'm always so interested, especially with the Hall of Fame coaches like, you know, Patino and Calipari and Krzyzewski and, and Roy Williams. Like, was it intimidation or was it like pure excitement or, or, or out-of-body experience? Or what was – what do you remember about just like how that felt? Uh, now, how what felt? Like, just like – I know you said you're excited. Like, this is Rick freaking Patino talking to you, you know? Like, he's, he's interested in you. Yeah, no, man, it was, it, it was super crazy. It took me a while to get my brains together, man, because, like I said, I was excited. I was jumping up and down, and, I, you know, I just couldn't <laughs> believe it was him on the phone, man, you know, because you know, I I was a big fan of, you know, Derek Anderson. And so all I remember is, like, man, he coached Derek Anderson and Ron Mercer, and I just remember that that tandem, and, and you know, I'm like, you know, that was the first thing that came to my mind. Like, I want to be like – he want to be like that tandem. That's what I was, you know, that's what I was thinking about. <laughs> and just the number of guys that he, you know, went on to produce to, to play professional ball. So um, it was a no brainer for me once he called. What do you think is, and I, I realize it's probably hard to pick one, but what would you say is the biggest thing or a couple things that you learned from, from playing with, uh, for Rick Pitino? Mental toughness, mental toughness. Uh, that was the biggest thing that I picked up. It just, you know, regardless of whatever's going on, uh, everything is all a mindset, uh, physical, mental. Uh, you know, if you have mental toughness, you can do or accomplish anything. And so that was the biggest thing I took away from him. Um, and just I just love his competitive nature. You know, I was already a competitive person, but, you know, his competitive nature really rubbed off uh, on, not only on me, but everybody on the team, man. And, and he sort of take on his personality. Uh, of by any means, by any means. And so that was the thing that we went across long. You got to get it done by any means. You know, it may not be textbook, but as long as you get it done, that we got to get it done. I remember even as a media guy, being in the basketball facility the day after a loss at Louisville is like you're walking on eggshells. Like you, you're – you just – everybody's in it. Everybody's afraid of, <laughs> of the next step because Patino is so mad about it. I know as he got older, right, this is well after your time. I think Russ Smith probably had as big a role as anyone in, in easing him, easing him down a little bit from uh-huh. after losses, but famous, famous for being tough to tough to uh, tough handling his team's losses after the games. Right, right, right. <laughs> he was, yeah, it, it was, man. After a loss, man, it was just like, man, you just hope you didn't go to practice the next day. <laughs> I mean, our, our, right after the game, you know, it was a time where we we did go and have to have practice right after the game. But uh, you just knew he was competitive and he was fiery and, 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 you know, he was liable to say anything to you after a loss, man. He just, he, he didn't like losing. He didn't like losing. And so that was one thing that really, uh, really sort of embedded 
in us that will to win and, and just not wanting to lose and not you know taking losing kindly like oh it's just a loss not no we didn't enjoy losing at all mm -hmm. yeah and i could see how that would have a good effect on on teams if the, if it's the right mentality for the players it could have a good effect on on the team um right. let's talk about that run that 2005 run say you're at i don't know a christmas party you're at an office party somewhere or something like that and you get cornered by a Louisville fan who wants to know your like lasting favorite moment or memory from that, from that run. Like, what's your story? What do you, what's your go-to thing that you would tell them from that 2005 uh, team's run in March? Uh, my story that I always talk to is about the halftime speech when we play West Virginia. That's one thing people always want to know is like, what did Patino say to you guys? Uh, at halftime during the West Virginia <laughs> game when you were down 20. That, you, I mean, it's, it's at least once once a month, man, somebody's asking, like, what, did, what, did, what did Petito say to you guys, man? And you guys came out in the second game. I said, honestly, man, he didn't say anything. Really? He, 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 didn't, he didn't say, say a word? No. Not much, man. It was more so the guys. It was more so the, the players amongst us uh, speaking. Ellis really got up and spoke, man, and um, – you know, really poured out his heart. You know, Coach was like, we scrapped in the press book. We actually got into a back and forth with Coach. Uh, Coach was like, you know, we can't press. We can't do this. And we was like, hey, man, the hell with that. This is what we're doing. He's like, well, we ain't got <laughs> enough players. And like, man, that's what we're doing. <laughs> so we was actually arguing with the coach at halftime, man. And so, uh, you know, we were just going there. We were going to go out. We were going to go out in, in, in the balls of glory, man. And so I know for me, uh, I was thinking, I'm like, man, first half, like, man, I didn't even hardly get any shots up. So I'm like, oh, man. So I knew the second half I was coming out shooting. So uh, it just turns <laughs> out everything everything worked out in our favor. But, yeah, that's one thing people always ask me about. What Patino say to you guys at halftime? Like, we didn't say anything. We had to scrap scrap our game plan, go to a whole new game plan, just whatever it takes to win. Well, I think that's a sign of, of an experienced squad to be able to, to be able to have that mature of a conversation in the locker room right. and to have um, the respect of your coach to be able to say, no, that we disagree with you. We want to do X, Y, and Z. We think we can do it and we just need to do it better. I mean, that's a big well, we, conversation. Yeah. We just had the respect because it worked. <laughs> if it didn't work, <laughs> it might've been a different story. <laughs> But it would have been our last game anyway. But if it didn't work, it might have been something else. But it just happened to work that time <laughs> on the biggest stage. <laughs> what, do, what do you think, like, what is something that people don't realize about um, going to the Final Four? Because w w some of my favorite stories that I ever did as a writer were with, usually it would be like with Denny Crum uh, around the 80 or 86 team or or – you know, just stories about the experience of like back then they had to watch the other elite eight game on a tiny TV on the bus to see who they were going to play the following weekend. And just like fun stuff like that. I mean, this big heroes welcome when they got back to Louisville, what are some things that people might not realize that players experience in that week between the elite eight and going off to the final four? Uh, one thing people may not realize, man, is how many people are asking you for tickets. <laughs> <laughs> that doesn't um, surprise me. That's good, man. But it's, it's just so much coverage, man. It's so much just centered around because you just got four teams, you mm -hmm. know, you know, normally you have coverage, but it's so many teams playing during the season and now it's down to four teams. And so like every media outlet from, not only the United States, but from different places in the world are all centered right there to cover the final four. And so, you know how big college basketball is, but once you get to the final four, you, you, you kind of get a different sense of how big it really is and how big of an accomplishment it really is to get there. Cause you know, you're so focused and so dialed in on who you're playing and trying to focus on practice and, you know, you got school and, and all these other things that you're trying to lock in on that you can't really take a breath and exhale and relax. Be like, man, this is amazing. And I never forget we were finishing up. We had a, a parade down to 4th Street Live and uh, a send off ceremony. The fans were excellent, man, and uh, had a big celebration for us. And I remember getting back on the bus and Scotty Davenport 
I was walking past him when I was getting on the bus. He said, you'll never understand the magnitude of what's going on until you finish playing. Mm. And he said that, and I was like, yeah, all right. I'm like, oh, we're going to play Illinois. <laughs> you know, like, yeah. And then, you know, years later, once time passes and you realize how significant it was, just, you know, his words really, you know, stuck with me like, man, he – he said it, you know, all along. But, you know, at the time, you're so locked in, you're so focused, you got so many other things going on that you don't really get to take in how big and how much the uh, ambiance is of the Final Four. Mm-hmm. That is, I'm, I'm not surprised that Scotty, of all people, had some uh, prolific comment that would, that would <laughs> be something that you think <laughs> about for a really long time. But that is – that that uh, – I was so interested. I covered the, um, the regional, uh, you remember a couple of years ago when Virginia was in Louisville, uh, and they had that crazy finish against Purdue and then they beat, mm-hmm. I think Oregon in the, um, no, it was Purdue in the elite eight. Uh, and they beat Oregon in the sweet city. It was crazy. That whole week was crazy. And Virginia had the previous season lost in the one sixteen game. So they were kind of on that mission of trying to avenge that whole experience from the year ago. And I'll never forget talking to Mamadi Diakite. And it was like his seventh interview session of the day. He was exhausted. And it was before the Elite Eight. He was exhausted and just saying, like, the coaches keep telling us, if nothing else, try to get your eight hours to 10 hours of sleep. Like, you've got to figure out a way to turn off and, and fall asleep. And it was, it was clear how overwhelming it was uh, for him. And I was a media member sitting there interviewing him. So, like, I mean, that hit home with me. So hearing you say that, like that does not surprise me whatsoever because there's just so much interest uh, and attention being paid that it's just like, hey, can you do this? Larry, can you do this interview? Larry, can you do this yeah. interview? In addition to the stuff at the arenas. Yeah, it, it is, man. And you're getting pulled, pulled so many different directions. And, um, you know, as a young kid, you know, you, you kind of enjoy it, but it, it can be tiresome because it seems like, you know, like, man, everybody's asking me the same question over and over mm-hmm. and over and over a thousand times a day. But for me, social media wasn't big back then mm-hmm. as it is now. So it's like totally different. And, you know, like we weren't walking around with our phone all the time, mm-hmm. checking Twitter or checking uh, Facebook or uh, Instagram or whatever social media platform that you use. You know, Facebook was just now coming in when I was exiting college, but I wasn't even on Facebook then. So wasn't really a lot of social media. So I can only imagine adding the platform that you have with social media now, how much more <laughs> coverage and how much more distractions it can be uh, yeah. at such a big event. Especially like guys now they'll post a photo on Instagram and within like five seconds, there's like a thousand likes on it and all these comments and yeah. stuff. I mean, that's gotta be, that's gotta be nuts. Uh, I forgot about that though. That's a great point because social media, I'm only a couple of years behind you in college. So Facebook would have just been coming out around that time, like 2004, yeah. 2005. Yeah. So you would have been a little more shielded from everything else, especially Twitter. Um, well, I got a couple more things I want to ask you and then I'll let you get out of here. But, uh, I know it's been, it's, it's tough for someone who's coaching and, and flying around and being, uh, being as busy as you are, but uh, I'm curious for your thoughts on what you have been able to see uh, of Louisville this season, what you think of this team. Um, uh, you know what, man, as sort of what's expected, a uh, young team, inexperienced team. So, you know, you kind of spec up and down. Uh, play you know you watch them play Florida State and you'd be like man you know the, you know they look like a young team but then you watch them play versus a Georgia Tech or you watch them play versus a Virginia Tech uh, you know be the good Virginia Tech team be like okay so they they learning and so sort of expecting the the ups and downs and the bump to come with a young team that really doesn't have a lot of experience uh, they have good experience at the point guard with uh, I think his name's Kalik yeah Carlick Jones yep Carlick Jones. And so, um, you know, they have good experience there and, and, and a big guy that they was relying on, uh, Malik uh, Williams, you know, he was hurt, somebody that they really could have counted on to, to bring some experience. So they're really just kind of finding a way. Um, but nevertheless, always proud of mine. The, the guys get out there and play hard. It's always good to see a 502 kid, David Johnson, doing well. Um, 
But, yeah, that's it. I haven't really been able to catch them as much as I have, like I said, because I'm coaching this year. And a lot of times mm -hmm. when they're playing, I'm either at practice yeah. or I have my own game that I'm coaching. So it's <laughs> tough for me to be able to sit and watch them uh, this year. But nevertheless, I'm still rooting for them from a distance. Yeah, that's that's once you get into the coaching grind, all the games are always at the same time. It's it's yeah, it's I know, tough. right? I know. <laughs> Did you? How and much? I really, I, I would have liked to have went. They were down here playing Georgia Tech, but they played at two o'clock in the afternoon. Yeah, on on a uh, what was that? On a on a on Monday, Monday, was, yeah, yeah, two o'clock, yeah, two o'clock yeah. in the afternoon. So, and I didn't even know that the game was at two o'clock. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, I wasn't able to make that, but usually when they do come in town to play Georgia Tech, I try to make it. Yeah, and that's a nice arena too. With it, it is. No offense is. to Georgia Tech, but there's typically <laughs> seats available for people to get into those games. Um, did you have you had much interaction with David Johnson over the years? Like I, I know he played for Ellis um, a little bit. Like, did you have you ever had a chance to to meet him or talk to him, or or is it just from afar? You just know he's a Louisville kid. No, nah, I just from afar, I know he's a little kid. Never, never had a chance to meet him. No. Yeah, he's an nah, interesting I'm, I'm player, pretty, man. Yeah, he, he he's a really, really, really good player. Um, I was, was he eighteen? I've been almost. I was playing professional ball almost as <laughs> long as he was living. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. So it, it's yeah. So he he definitely wouldn't know who I was, but um, <laughs> he you know he definitely got a fan, man. And so. I uh, definitely want to see him continue to do well, continue to grow as a basketball player and a young man. Well, speaking of professional basketball, I told you I was going to ask you about this. So at, at, at the end of any conversation I've had with guys who have played overseas and you've you had a, a great career overseas. What I guess, first of all, what is your I guess I'm sure you have many thoughts about it, but what was maybe your biggest takeaway from that experience and then I always like to ask if there is like one strange thing that that you still remember that was maybe a cultural difference or whatever. I still I laugh so hard at at like this guy playing in Lithuania. His coach sold meat out of the trunk of his car after practice. Uh, there's, a, <laughs> there's a goat sacrifice in Turkey uh, before a game. I mean, just like crazy stuff. So. What do you got? What what's what do you what comes to mind when you're thinking about your time playing overseas? Uh man, I was in an interesting game one time and we were playing and it was eight thousand people. And and the and the difference between games in the US and games in Europe is they're like soccer games. Mm -hmm. Fans are standing up singing and chatting the whole time. There's no sitting down, clapping, everybody's <laughs> sitting, jumping, you know, there's flares at the game uh lighters and so one time i was playing and so uh i'm bringing the ball down court it's a big rivalry game i'm playing in belgrade serbia mm -hmm. and so i'm bringing the ball down court and all of a sudden you hear this bang 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 and like people in the, the crowd was throwing m80s on the basketball court <laughs> <laughs> and so i'm nervous because you know i don't it sounds like gunshots and, mm -hmm. and in Serbia, you know, they, there's been shootings after the game. So, oh, like, yeah. you know, I didn't know what had taken place. I just know I dropped the ball and shot to the tunnel for, for where our locker room was. <laughs> and so it was the scariest thing for me, man. But uh, that's probably by far the craziest thing that's, that's ever happened. Um, that place, man, because I, I, I spent a month in Serbia uh, in February. And what th what'd you think? It, it, I, I was surprised at how much I liked some of it. Um, I, I, I will never get used to being around smoking. And that was really, that was super hard. Cause they still smoke in restaurants and stuff. And like, it was everything, <laughs> everything smells really bad. And uh, everyone, yeah. I mean, everyone smokes. Um, but I went to a partisan uh, red star game. It was, I think it was a cup game. And they only allowed one of the club's teams. And I think it was, they only allowed red star fans in because they were worried that it would turn violent. And even then they were still throwing stuff at the court and the cops had to like escort the players off the floor because people were throwing stuff at the floor, at the, at the players, like pens and lighters and all this different stuff. It's just a whole other universe, man. It's, it's just totally different. Right. Right. Uh, and, you know, another thing, man, is I had a teammate that would smoke cigarettes at halftime of the game. 
they, you know, it brought That's up a memory right. when, you, when you said that, man. He, he smokes cigarette, but we'll come out and give you 30, though. <laughs> come out, kill you in the first half, smoke a cigarette by the back door, <laughs> flick it out, come out, warm up, man, and give you another 20 in the second half, man. It, it was amazing, <laughs> man. I said, man, how, how do you do that, man? He's like, oh, shit, it's just me. It's like, and man, it wasn't like he wasn't like this physical guru guy, just looked like your average Joe, wasn't you know, wasn't muscular or real fit. I mean, he was in shape, but like if you look at him, you just you think he was an ordinary <laughs> Joe, but man will come out and give you buckets, man. <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of guys in Europe who you look at them and you're like, that guy is not gonna be able to play in this game with with guys who played in the NBA or college players who had come over. And then they turn around and give you like 18 and 12 and they're great passers. You know, like it, it, it just caught me off guard in like Bayern Munich had guys like that at, at, in the Euro league, a bunch of teams in Serbia had guys like that. I mean, it was just, it was just really impressive. Um, the, the, the talent level for guys who do not look like they would be talented basketball players. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah <laughs> well, um, I'll leave you with this thought, Larry, and I really appreciate your time and, and you coming on. Uh, it, just imagine Rick Pitino coaching Panathinaikos and being in Belgrade and doing a, a press conference that was translated into Serbian. It was as funny as you could possibly imagine um, watching him do that <laughs> and like wait for people to laugh at his jokes. His team got got beaten in the second half pretty bad. And the one thing never changes. He still had his coconut water and he still had his towel that he was leaning on on the sidelines and he was still kick the stanchion and stuff too. But everything else was very different in, in Europe for your old coach. So it was very entertaining. Yeah, man. He, 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 he's funny. And I think it was a great experience for him just to experience that, you know, mm -hmm. outside. He's always been in the NBA and college basketball, but now he can kind of experience that international flavor and just, uh, you know, it can sort of broaden your horizons, man, to how other things are done and just not the American way. So I think he really enjoyed it. He embraced it. He embraced the Greek culture, man. Uh, he embraced the Euro League. I think he saw a different style of basketball mm -hmm. than what he's used to. And so I think I think he really enjoyed it, though. I really did. I think uh, if he was younger, I think he may have stayed a little longer, but he wanted to get back, uh, you know, his family, his grandkids and everything else. So. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a great experience that he can look back upon and, and tell stories and, and share about and relate to with his college kids now at Iona. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, Larry O'Bannon, the host of the Players Perspective Uncensored PPU podcast. You can follow it on Twitter at the PPU podcast. Thank you so much for your time, man. I appreciate it. Uh, people love hearing from uh, from former Louisville players back here in Louisville. So I appreciate uh, you taking a few minutes. Thank you. I appreciate you having me, man. All right.